Now, this is not San Francisco. Hi again, everybody. I'm Jim Kelly, and welcome. Today, we're here in the heart of the village's historic Town Square district, a turn-of-the-century scenic collection of shops, restaurants, boutiques, and offices where you can dine, dance, and yes, even go bowling in two state-of-the-art bowling centers. But today, outside, under the Florida sun, just a Pete Weber strike away from the Town Square gazebo, the villages hosting the PBA's best for the finals of the Sun Bowl. That's right, a bowling championship outside. How do you do that? Well, to find out, you're going to have to stick around. All right, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure to introduce you to our top five for the Villages Sun Bowl. In the number five position, a former PBA Rookie of the Year, one of only four to own the PBA's Triple Crown. 25-time champion, PBA Hall of Famer, Pete Weber! <laughs> Joining him in the number four position is a four-time champion on Pro Bowlers Tour from Newark, New York, Doug Kent. <laughs> and in the number three position, 27 PBA titles in all, the only player to capture the Super Slam. He's rolled 300 on national TV, PBA Hall of Famer, Mike Aldi! And our number two seed for today's championship round is a former Rookie of the Year, two titles to his credit, from Wichita, Kansas, Chris Barnes! And our tournament leader is a former PBA Rookie of the Year, eight titles to his credit, two times the winner of the Tournament of Champions, from nearby Claremont, Florida, Jason Couch! You know, they like to say here at the, the Villages, they're not selling homes, they're selling lifestyle. I can tell you one thing, they've sold plenty of tickets. It's been sold out for over a week. We are outdoors under the Florida sh sunshine. Hi again, everybody. Jim Kelly along with PBA Hall of Famer David Ozio here. The biggest difference, of course, we're not inside. What kinds of problems will the weather, the sun, the wind create? The players all this week were inside in controlled climate. They had no physical problems. Today, outside, we have heat, we have humidity, and we had rain earlier. It's causing the players' hands to expand, and they're sticking in the ball a lot more than what they did all week. So this is going to be the paramount factor this week. David, if you lose your spot out there in the lanes behind us, if it's in the sun glare, what do you do to correct the problem? Well, everyone is going to have that problem with glare or whatnot. It's going to take the players focusing on what they're doing and spending the extra time it needs to throw the perfect shot. No matter what is the end result, they have to throw a great shot. So they're all faced with the same problem. <laughs> well, one problem we had, if you come to Florida, the weather can change almost instantaneously. We had some drizzle earlier, so a bit of a delay. But let's get to the lane conditions and the weather right now. Well, the lane conditions this week were a 46-foot pattern, and it was buffed oil to seven feet buff to 46 feet in a reverse christmas tree there's no presence given here folks the lanes conditions were very very difficult speed adjustments had to be made and the players conquered them the weather today 82 degrees the winds are five to ten miles an hour out of the southeast occasionally gusting and the players may have a problem with that so we are ready to go in match number one seated fourth doug kent out of newark new york and pete weber out of missouri the right-hander just one win away from tying his father in terms of victories. The Villages, a sellout here for the Sun Bowl finale outside. First up, right-hander Pete Weber. Pete's first shot. Excellent shot by Mr. Weber. No holes barred, Pete calls for. He says, I am on to play today. Doug Kent. 13 years of pro, 11 as a touring pro with four PBA national titles and three regional crowns. Well, he says he thrives on the pressure. He lives for who you bowl against and how you're bowling. Said he gets his blood pumping. As he's been struggling for five or six weeks despite the fact he's coming off a great fall. Two in a row. 
great shot by Doug. He told me this today that he is going to opt to slow the ball down and try to circle the lane a little bit more. He's going to have to do that to control the pocket. Weber now off a strike in the first. Great shot off Pete's hand. He is here to win. He has told me that he's going to do everything possible. He's put his pass behind him, and he is ready to do the job necessary today to turn this one in. Talking Matt. about the Weber, the uh, weather last night with Pete Weber. Said, obviously, when you're in Florida, it can play havoc when you're outside. But he said, you know what? I'm not going to worry about it. I'm going to talk to my wife tonight on the phone, not talk about anything heavy, just kind of relax, get a good night's sleep. Well, he's obviously showing some lactation right now because he's throwing excellent shots. Another excellent shot right here. He should get paid. Great shot. And he's going to show, show some emotion. Pete is a very, very, very emotional player, and he will jump in and give Doug all he wants. Match is all even at this point. Great shot by Doug. I think he got that one just a little bit too far to the right. The ball came in a little bit behind the head pin. Solid 10 stands. When the ball enters the pocket, light flush, the ball's going to enter that solid, lead that solid 10. So he's got to make a spare right now. Routine spare. These guys do this day in, day out. Should be no problem. Now, Doug can't let that bother him. He's going to have to get up on the left lane and refocus his thoughts and just go back to throwing a great, great shot. That's what it's going to take in order to keep him in this match. Weber's a, Weber's a very tough competitor. Might have got that in a little bit. 13th in the PBA World Power Rankings. We're at the Villages in Central Florida, and we've got five terrific bowlers in the final. The Sun Bowl under the Florida Sun. We'll be right back. A standing room sellout crowd here at the Villages. Pete Weber, 38 years old, seated fifth, just one win away from tying his legendary dad. A little extra pressure, maybe. Well... I think Pete will accomplish some of the tasks his dad accomplished because he is an outstanding player. You don't mess with this guy. When he's on, he's on. Pete told me he elected to start out a little bit farther today and play the second arrow. All week, he played deeper than the fourth arrow, throwing it real slow to the right and hooking it back to the pocket. And he said, I'm going to take a shot at this. If I turn it into something, I can do well. But I'll tell you what, as soon as it falters, I'm moving in and going for it. Four in a row. He is the kind of player, too, that is plenty capable of shooting 300. He's done it many, many times, and I'll tell you, there's been a couple, two or three times he's actually had 10 in a row on the telecast. A little left tap, you go, boy. Pete's going to tell him about it. That's all there is to it. He's going to tell him about it. Great shot by Pete. The confidence is just exuding from his body. By the way, a 300 game in the championship round worth an extra $10,000 here at the Villages. Uh, Doug Kent, who has had some very impressive finishes recently, how come? Doug Kent, in my mind, is the premier player of the last three years. I'll give him the most improved athlete on tour. He's learned to do a lot more things with the bowling ball, and he can control the pocket a lot better than he could three years ago, which has led him up to being one of the premier players now. So look to see a lot from him in the future. Getting around about the Florida sun last night, he said, well, the first thing I might do if it's too hot and too bright is wear a hat. <laughs> he did say that, but I like his style in the shorts right now, so uh, he looks pretty cool. And the sunglasses, just got to trust your instinct a little bit. Yes, oh! Doug told me before the match he's got to be cognizant of his speed. If he throws it a little bit too hard, the ball's going to go a little bit too long, as that shot did right there. So he has got to trust his speed in order to make those perfect shots. The official PBA practice centers support the PBA and are in place to go bowl in a league, have a party, or roll a few games. Open play, there are several hundred participating centers 
throughout the country. And for a complete listing, just a mouse click away at PBA.com. Now, Doug stands extremely far up on the approach. When he has to throw the ball slow, that's what he does. It backs his speed down. So that is a tool in his bag of tricks, so to speak, in order to help him slow the swing down. And he told me this was going to be a real tough for him to, thing to, for him to accomplish today because of the fact that it's a different environment and the wind and all the factors. And so I'm sure they're all playing havoc on him right now. That he's been second guessing himself quite a bit this week and said you can't do that he's having trouble repeating his good rhythm and just not trusting his swing and his mechanics well he's not had an exceptional last few weeks uh, the talented player that he is and so he said he really needed to break through this week and have a good finish in order to boost his morale and his confidence going into next week so we'll just see what happens here in the next few frames like a good shot from here wow excellent pitch he might have been just a little bit faster with the speed he's going to drive the ball uh, maybe two foot farther down the lane which is going to make the ball enter behind the head pin push the six in front of the 10 and the 10 pin will stand routine spare covers it perfectly and a nice round of appreciation after his first ball for the start after four in a row for the man that you have described, interestingly enough, is somewhat of a loose cannon. <laughs> Pete is a loose cannon. I'll tell you what, you never know what to expect from him. You know, he's fresh off of an suspension, and he wants to guard his actions to maximize his performance out on the tour. The tour really needs him, and he is, so to speak, the John McEnroe of our tour. So, you know, we're going to try to help him out and keep him in check. Wow, another great shot. This one did just the opposite, a little higher on the head pin, more up towards the 19th and a half board as it goes into the pocket. The ball just walks right by the nine pin, leaves it standing. Perfectly 26 covered. 26 PBA titles for Dick Weber. One more. And, well, Dad will be tied by the sun. Weber in front over Doug Kent when we come right back. They are rocking here at the Villages. Dave Ozio is alongside. Right now, Doug Kent is down by 53 pins. He is going to have to mount a major turnaround to come up and catch Weber. You've been in this situation. When you're behind psychologically, when does it start to work on your head? Long about now, that's for sure. He, in his mind right now, has to focus solidly on throwing nothing but great shots because Weber's not going to let him up. And so I really see right now that that's the only thing that's on his mind. Ask him the key to qualifying. Of course, you know, the Saturday uh, routine is as hard as anything. And he said, well, the key for him yesterday was hand position and the feel of the reaction. Well, the players this week had to gear their speeds down in order to make the ball what we call read the mid lane. They want the ball to break around 32, 33, 34 foot and then turn go back to the pocket. The only way they could achieve this was slowing their speed down. And that's what D Doug did so well in order to make it this far. On the comeback trail, perhaps, the man from Newark, New York. Pete is now up 31 pins. He's on a spare. I don't suspect him at all letting off on the gas. He's going to be full throttle ahead. Goal of both Doug and Pete to be the PBA Player of the Year. You were back in 91. What does that do to boost one's career? Well, it's... There's goals that we all like to achieve out here, and that was one of them, you know. When they come out to fulfill that, that's just a niche in the gun handle, and, you know, I'm just happy to have it. Five in a row, then two spares. You cannot throw a shot any better than that, and the reaction shows it. Pete does something that a lot of the players on tour don't do. He gets the ball to roll extremely heavy on the lane. And whenever a ball is rolling heavy like that, it keeps the pins down once it goes into the pocket. And so that equates into more strikes on a day-in, day-out basis. And that's why he's as famous as he is. This could be the put-away shot right here very easily for Pete Weber. If this one goes down, I pretty well think it's all over. That should be game over. Pete thinks it's over, too. 
Doug up just to finish the game out, save a little face. He'd like to strike out, but he's not going to get it. Doug told me first off, he said, you know, if I match up real well and if I can get the speed set perfectly, then I should do all right. But he's just ran into a bulldog in Pete Weber. Well, I mean, you bowlers are no different than golfers out there. I mean, you get into a r routine, a rhythm. Yeah, and, and once you get set into that, see, Doug would like to have thrown the ball a little bit more firmly today. This is a little bit slow for him, so he said. So, you know, I mean, there's times when you do the best you can and take what you get, and Pete's happy right now. And you notice when Pete throws a shot, uh, uh, sorry, Doug throws a shot, Pete's looking away. And so I really suspect Pete will do that all the rest of the day. Pete's not concerned at all. Well, not even watching. He's, he's looking up at the scoreboard. He's looking across the street at the historic downtown and looking up at the sun. Well, he's a comfortable winner right now, too, so it's easy to sit over there on that sidelines being a winner and just soak in the sights. <laughs> Doug finishes with a 172 game. Not as good as he would have liked, but I'll tell you what, there'll be plenty more days for Doug Kent. He is a great, great player. Now, our scoring system this week is going to be a little bit different than most weeks. Normally, we use a 20-pin scoring system, and they've changed this over to a 30-pin scoring system. What that means is, on a 30-pin system, we're working off the maximum amount of score the bowler can bowl for the entire game. For example, if a player starts off with a double and then has a nine spare, and then the other player starts off with three in a row, the person with three in a row can potentially bowl 300. The player with two in a row nine spare can only bowl 279, so therefore that would make him minus 21. So that is the new system we're working off of, and that way the lead changes can swing back and forth more drastically. So it's just something that adds a little more excitement to the game and puts the players under a little bit more heat. Well, you might have seen on that last <laughs> strike that was thrown by Doug Kent that he was having a little trouble with the footwork. We had rain earlier. They covered up the lanes as quickly as possible. You know it took about 45 minutes to resurface. Right. They, what they did was they reconditioned the lanes. They completely stripped the oil and redid the lanes completely. And also they maintenance the approaches because it's, it's very, very, very important to have perfect slide as it is for a perfect shot. So that's what he's doing right there is wiping the dirt off the lane and possibly any humidity or sweat. So Pete Weber trying to tie his famous father, Dick Weber, with 26 PBA titles. will be the winner of match number one. He'll go up against Mike Alby when we come right back to the sold-out villages. Magnificently groomed golf courses, 171 holes designed for every skill level. In fact, Chichi Rodriguez invites you to play two of his favorite golf holes right here at the villages. So we did, starting with PBA commissioner Ian Hamilton. I think I can sign up for golf school at the villages. Ladies and gentlemen, Grammy winner, Walter Ray. <laughs> and the pride of Ocala, Florida right here, a man that is obviously in the Hall of Fame and picked up his 31st title this year, earlier winning a major in Toledo. Straight down the middle. What about a man who's the top seed? He warmed up by playing 18 with us, Jason Couch. Oh. Good to the last drop. Back to back pars. He's catching fire. That pin was wiggling the whole time. That was a loose tooth. With the man who obviously bowling is not affected by my golf game and also the top seed, here's Dave. Thanks, Jim. I'm down here with our tournament leader, Jason Couch. Now, Jason, you have led events this year twice and you have failed miserably. <laughs> Are, is the news coming off today? Surely the news is coming off. What do you think? Well, Dave, I think that uh, there's been 250 shot at me all three weeks I've been on the telecast, but today there's going to be a 250 shot. It's going to be mine. Well, you have had some big scores bowled at you, but, uh, you know, I've got all the confidence in the world. You are my hero. He's ready, Jim. Up to you, buddy. Jason Couch, the top seed. You can see the sellout crowd here at the Villages. So match number two out of Indianapolis, Indiana. Mike Alby already into the winner's circle. Just outside San Francisco earlier this year. Winning in Daly City, California. He was the second seed that week. And he finished up first.
Ask him about bowling outside today in the sun here at the villages, and he said he didn't think it would be a problem because a couple of years ago, back in 98, he had to bowl outside in a championship in Italy on the beach, and they bowled that day from noon until 6. So a little sunblock and a little, a little bit of the sunglasses. Pete Weber dispensed with uh, Doug Kent, 246 to 198 in match number one. Pete is hopefully hoping that he has not lost his rhythm in a little bit of time down, and this will start to tell the tale right here. Bingo. There he is. No loss of rhythm for the main man. Pete Weber had five in a row to start the first, and has had pretty good success factor. That's today. That's today alone, yes. He opted to go a little bit more direct on the pattern this week than he did all week. He was hooking the ball a lot more. Pete says, if I hang on with this and it works, I'm going to stay with it. Now, the lanes are going to start breaking down. He's, he's literally burning a hole into the, the skid pattern right there, which is going to make the ball start hooking early eventually. So he's going to adjust to it the best he can. He is not very happy with that. But you know something? Pete Weber is one of the few players out here that we have, we call has a really seriously tilted axis. And that will mean that the bowling ball comes off his hand on the side and rotates more in a right to left direction, which ends up having the ball a lot of times go that deep into the pocket to run right by the nine. Pete Weber leaves more solid nines on tour than just about anybody. The left-hander out of Indy, Mike Albee now. Talked a lot outside of Daly City there when he was winning about his son, Chris, who's an excellent double-A squirt hockey player for the Indy Racers. Chris is off this week to the high school state championships, but Dad is staying in phone contact. Mike leaves a soft seven, and you notice that he looked down at the approach. So we've had some sprinkles here on and off, and so those shoes refuse to slide on the sprinkles. Mike's key to today also was to stay soft, really stay soft with his release and to rotate the ball real smoothly onto the lane. This will keep the ball from making abrupt direction changes and that's gonna be really the key for him today. I'll be up on the left lane at minus one, so he needs to get something going. He is looking in the face of a fearless tornado. Paid a lot. He mentioned that he won in Sun Daily just outside San Francisco. I asked him, did that help him at all this week? And he just laughed. He said, well, it didn't help me last week because he made the final five last week. Huh? Right. Well, Mike's been bowling well all year. He won a tournament earlier this year on a pattern that he really likes. This pattern here this week, he said he didn't really like it that much, but he had to adjust his speed down. And he said, he's, you know, he's going to take anything he can get. And I'll tell you what, he's done well so far. To set the wind current. You talked about how many times he cashed. Explain. Right. Cashed is how many times that he actually went to the pay window this year. We use that term cashed as he made money for the week. And that could be anywhere from first place check down to the 40th place check, provided we have a field of 120 bowlers. So anytime you make money, you have cashed in the event, and we all use that term as best we can. Yes, sir. Ozio cash this week. I saw him at the ATM. <laughs> I actually finished 26 this week. I needed, I thought I got three strikes in the attempt to make it, and I thought I was going to be in match play, but a lot of other guys went around the number also, so I was a little short. That was, by the way, Pete Weber's wife, Tracy, that you saw there in kind of the uh, off-yellow outfit. She is not allowed to wear red on TV. Some bowlers have superstitions, and that's one of Pete's, so Tracy... The red outfits don't make the TV show. Well, I'll tell you what, I've got my own set of superstitions also. I think we all do as players. Pete's up with a 12-pin lead right now, and he wants desperately to have this strike right here so he can get an edge on Mike Albee. Mike Albee is an outstanding mental player, and he don't want to give up anything to that guy. There you go. He's going to show it, too. He is all into this game right now, and he has got win on his mind. David, do other players resent emotional players' reactions? 
it can be intimidating. If a player is really on a high and as Mike right now is struggling a little bit, then he is going to absolutely kind of stick it in his face. And some of the other players sometimes react ne negatively, negatively to it. All right, Mike caught a great shot right there. He's kept it tight on line. He got his hand to the side of the ball and got the heavy roll on it that he was looking for. It is paramount that he gets the ball rolling heavy and slowly in order to make the corner to get the ball deep enough into the pocket to send the pits to the back pins to the back of the pit. It's kind of interesting if you're watching on the monitor here, watching live as we are, because you've got two dramatically different players. I mean, this man on the screen kind of keeps everything in. Meanwhile, Pete Weber, he lets everything out and then some. Well, I, I would probably give Mike Albee the best mental player on tour. On, baby, he has on. the ability to support yeah. his emotions and only bring them out when he needs. And there you have it, right there. He brings them out. He wants that strike. He is not going to let Weber get away from him at best possible. Albee, by the way, had a 300 game here earlier this week. That was obviously the high. There were two 300 games this week. Mike Albee bowled one, as well as Ryan Schaefer. Looks like it's a little wide from here. Yeah. He probably got it outside target. Probably no more than a half board or three quarters of a board. And the ball read the lane a little bit long. Turns late to the pocket. And the five pin didn't get over to get the job done. So he's got a routine spare right here in the seven pin. David Ozio talking about how wide it was. It was halfway to the polo field, the four softball fields you and I saw yesterday on our tour. That's this, how wide it was. This place is fabulous. I happened to ask one of the gate guards this week, do I qualify to, to get in here? And he said, well, are you 55? And I said, almost. <laughs> this is an absolute gorgeous place. I am just enthralled with it. Where we stand in the match right now. Asking Pete Weber where he would feel the pressure in being on TV today. He said the very first ball because it it's been a while. Yes, it has been a while for Pete. He's gone through the torment of the ups and downs that players go through, and so he wants back in the game. And he's been out of the game for so long, and if you notice back over the years, he's been out of the game a couple of times. Well, he dispensed with Doug Kent in the first, and he's got a tough man. He's up against now Mike Halby in the second. Back at the Villages, first time they've hosted a national tour stop. They've had the seniors here two or three times, back in 91, 98, and this year, of course. Right, and they had a great tournament here. Roger Workman won that senior event, I believe, and it was a great win for him. Pete Weber is currently nine pins down, and he is looking away. He does not want to see what Mike Albee does right here. And if he strikes, yeah. and which he does, that puts Pete in marginal trouble. So. Pete has not gotten a freebie here today with Mike Albee, and Mike Albee's going to see to it that it is not given to him. That's part of that intimidation. He's not looking at Albee right there on your screen. He's not looking at the lanes. He is looking 90 degrees to the right away from everything. I believe that's more mental preparation because he doesn't want to know what goes on. In case Mike Albee throws a bad shot and goes Brooklyn or trips a six or something like that, sometimes that plays on the competitor's mind, and you'll get up and throw a bad shot right after it. So... I think that he's probably doing the right thing right now, the, the flow that he's in. Catch a roll, catch a roll. Oh, there are rumors, and it's ironic because he won in Daly City, as Weber's looking away, that Mike Albee is thinking about retirement. Any truth to that? Mike has acquired a bowling center a few years ago, and he took on a partner, Scott Devers, who is running the facility for him right now. The rumors are unfounded. Mike says he wants to be out here. He loves the game. He loves the action. And the thrill of winning a tournament is still in his blood. So I suspect he's going to be here for a long time. It's a 32-lane bowling center back in Lafayette, Indiana, called Mike Albee's Arrowhead Bowl. All right, Pete's back up on the right lane, and he is looking to capitalize on his 15-pin lead that he has right now. I'm going to say that he's going to want this one pretty bad, and if he strikes, you're going to see some emotion. Well, we've been on this ride today several times. Another solid nine. 
he tilts that axis so hard that the ball rolls heavy down the lane, catches the dry boards at the end of the lane, and then rolls up into the pocket too high flush, if you can imagine that, leaving a solid nine. So routine spare, he should cover it with no problem. You can see right there just how high in the pocket the ball was. It was almost to the four six point. <laughs> I don't know what that was. A bad imitation of the dirty chicken dance, I guess. He is. The new Sport Bowling League program created by the American Bowling Congress and the Women's International Bowling Congress being offered to bowlers who wish to compete on the most challenging of lane conditions. The PBA, an active participant with the ABC in promoting this program. Look for sports leagues at a bowling center near you. Pete is a huge wrestling fan. And I wouldn't be surprised at all when he really gets it going, he's going to do these, whatever the moves are that those guys do. He really loves that stuff. There he is. Great shot. And he says, well, that one struck. Why didn't the last one strike? The only difference is that ball might have been a half inch to the right of where the last ball was on the right lane in the pocket. Sent the six into the 10. Perfect strike. 10 pins in the back of the deck. If he strikes out, Mike score. 244. Mike says, no time to be thinking negative right here. I need a great shot. Tag. Yeah. That's what he was looking for right there. He is a true, true champion with an outstanding mental game. So you don't ever cut him short in that department right there. The outdoor conditions affecting Mike's speed choice at all? He said the lanes were a little tighter today to the left of target, and they wasn't quite that, that tight, tight meaning oily to the right of where he projects the ball this week inside under controlled climate. This week, he said today, especially, there's a little bit more oil to the left, so he has to back down on the speed to get the ball to turn the corner to get into that deep spot of the pocket. So that's what he's really thinking about right now. Whoa. That ball right there was clearly inside a target. He cut it off a little bit. He may have stuck a little bit at the foul line, but you can tell at the bottom of the swing, he cuffed it. His thumb went down on the shot, which steers the ball to the right of the intended target. So he's not very happy with that shot right there at all. And you saw who snuck a little peek. <laughs> well, anytime that I know that I've got any kind of lead at all on Mike Albee, I'm a happy camper. Just before he stood up, he just shook his head a little frustrated. Pete's up in the ninth right here. Desperately wants another strike. Pete can strike out for 239. The best Mike Albee can do is 224. So this is, well, I'm going to tell you exactly. This is not, yeah, this is a key shot right here. He, if he gets this one right here, he's going to really put the, the hammer down on Mike to set himself up for the 10th frame. And the first ball in the 10th frame will put the match over. Well, you know what? There's going to come a time when we all get frustrated, as this man is right here with that. These are all excellent bowling shots. It's just that his role is a byproduct of that tap right there, which not very many people leave on a consistent basis. I've seen Pete leave five or six of them in one game alone. Scale of one to ten, what do you give Pete Weber's bowling work ethic? Pete told me that in December, he and his dad started practicing two hours a day. And that's something really rare for Pete. He generally doesn't practice a lot, and his game's always been managed well. Well, he said that, you know, it's time to, to get back on it and, and put some time in. He spent two hours every single day working on his game before the tour started. And I'll tell you what, it showed up here, especially at this end of the season here, really well. That was nine pin number five for Pete Webber. And that is a frustrating, that would be like a right-hander, let's say, for example, myself, leaving solid eights. I don't throw as much ball as Pete does, and so I come into the pocket and leave a solid eight. That many of them would be really frustrating. This is clearly Pete's worst shot of the day. Now, whether the solid nine has taken his mind away from execution, it is showing up right here. Now, he's left the five-count washout. Now, he can't let himself get too awry here. He's going to have to barely slide the ball on the left-hand side of the one pin. He's going the other way, and he made it! 
great shot by Mr. Weber. There's two ways you can make that spare. You can shoot it on the left-hand side of the one pin, the one into the six, into the ten, or you can go right in between, deflect the ball off the one into the six ten and make it as he threw it absolutely perfectly right there. Twenty-two years of touring pro. One win, as we pointed out, away from tying his famous father and a little frustrated with that effort there. Mike he finishes Alby. up with 204. He needs to mark right here. Mike does. Yes, a mark meaning he needs just to convert any kind of spare and just stay out of trouble. No gutter balls, no big splits, no nothing. Flush up. Yeah, this game. game over. Fire, go. Mike Alby is your winner. Now. Well, we started with 111. The Village's Sun Bowl by the numbers. We are down to just three. Mike Albee will advance. Next up, it'll be Chris Barnes. All he's got to do is stay behind the foul line now. That's, that's really important, which I don't think will be a problem for Mike. The best he can bowl is 224. Uh, if he converts the spare, it'll be 214 game. Solid performance. Mike, I'm sure, is extremely happy with getting out of this game alive. Sellout crowd. We're outside at the Villages, and this man, Pete Weber, well, we talked about his suspension for 10 months. Well, you can hear about that and much more in his own words. <laughs> Meanwhile, the town square, the center of fun here at the Villages, restaurants, sidewalk cafes, first-run films, holiday street festivals, and free entertainment every night. Welcome back. No question, the good times roll right here at the Villages. In fact, there are two bowling centers, the Fiesta Bowl and Spanish Spring Lanes, each featuring 32 lanes of bowling fun. We've got some bowling fun before a sellout crowd under the Florida skies right here. Mike Albee over Pete Weber, 214 to 204. So Albee advances against Chris Barnes, but first we talked about an inside look at Mr. Weber. This week, the PBA Player Profile takes a look at Pete Weber, the acknowledged great player with a bad image. But is that accurate? I, I tell people that, uh, well, if they're going to label me the bad boy, I got no problem being the bad boy. I, I think I do it in a, in a very tactful way. I guess maybe sometimes I don't. But uh, if I didn't, would that really be Pete Weber? Being the real Pete Weber last year led to a 10-month suspension. So what did he do with his time off? Well, let's see. Where do we start? Let's see. I learned how to do the laundry. I learned how to iron. <laughs> learned how to dust. Learned how to do dishes. <laughs> uh, but uh, I still had my times to play golf. I bowled a summer league with my wife, Tracy. Uh, Bowled a winter league, started a winter league. In fact, when the tour's over, I still got eight weeks of league left when I get home. So it's not like I didn't practice or stay in shape. If I wasn't at home, I was pretty much at the golf course or, or out on the barbecue pit cooking. And now Mr. Weber's back out on tour. So just how hard did Pete take that suspension? It really wasn't difficult. I guess the more difficult thing was coming back in January, you know, thinking of... I got to walk on, I'm walking on pins and needles, and it's like, I wasn't even thinking, I guess I wasn't even thinking about bowling. And this week, it's like, you don't walk on pins and needles, you don't think this way. You think bowling, and you think of how to get the job done. So let's do, let's think that way. And now I've thought that way, and I'm not worried about walking on the pins and needles right now, and I'm bowling good, so I, I'm feeling really good right now. So how does the viewer differentiate between the man they see on TV and the Pete Weber they might meet in person? Well, what they're seeing is Pete Weber doing his job, doing what it takes to get the job done. That's what they're seeing. And they perceive that as, God, what a jerk or something like that. And it's like, well, I mean, come on. What do you do at your work that makes you so good at your job? Okay, that's the first question I have for them. But then again, do they, because of what they see on the lanes, do they refuse to come and try and talk to me afterwards? I mean, if they ask me for an autograph, they know I, I'm telling you straight out, you'll get it. There's no deal. I mean, you ask, I give. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. And if you want to ask me questions, I answer questions. I mean, it's just... I, I believe I'm one of the easiest people 
to get along with off the lanes that you could have. While the suspension might be behind Pete the bowler, did it help the future for Pete the husband? Oh, I think it did. Uh, did a little role reversal there where she got up and went to work and I stayed home and took care of the house and got the mail and started writing the bills out even. I don't know how I got into that, but uh, I did. But uh, yeah, we, we became a lot closer. Uh, we know a lot more about each other now and uh, I just, it can't be any better. It's Mike Albee up against Chris Barnes from a sold-out crowd. They're on their feet under the Florida sunshine here at the Villages. PBA Hall of Famer David Ozio is alongside. Glad you're on board. The Villages Sun Bowl, the final. Chris Barnes out of Wichita, Kansas, the very personable right-hander. But he has made 12 shows last year with a big goose egg and three more this year with a goose egg. And that is definitely on his mind. It is hugely on his mind, and I think that his goal today is is going to knock this onus off his shoulders. He is too great a bowler to be going 15 consecutive telecasts with no win, and he's out to prove it today. He has a phenomenal game. His backswing is incredibly straight, and he is there every single week. Now I've got to look up and find out how you knock an onus off your shoulder. Well, you know what? I just pull that out of the air. Best right or right, who cares? <laughs> Trick with this is going to be Albie. Albie threw four bad shots in the game against Weber. Weber left all those solid nines. Technically, Pete bowled a better game than Mike. Mike outscored him. That will not be allowed this game. Chris Barnes is going to make life rough on him because Chris Barnes is that good a player, and he's bowling that well right now. So Mike better guard his Hurry up. Shoes. Whoa, he wasn't sure it was going to get there. Success factor on lane one and lane two in his match against Pete Weber. Mike's got to be thinking, no slip-ups here. I want to throw a great shot as I can throw. Mike's going to take his time, focus on the target. He wants the ball to come off his hand nice and slow and smooth as the methodical player that he is and get a heavy roll on the ball. In result, 10 and a pit. Chris Barnes was pretty honest talking to me last night. Talked about his terrible start earlier in the week. I mean, after the first couple of games, he was headed to the airport. He shot 157-149, his very first two games of the event and you know what he did not give up he went to work got the right ball to match the condition he said he moved extreme to the left and slowed his speed down and swung the ball across the fifth arrow out to about the third arrow and let the ball roll in nice and slow but all the players this week had to do that that was really the only true way to play the lanes and so he put it all together and now he's on the telecast so that just proves the talent that the man has Baby split here, maybe not that good a shot, and he's going to shoot cross lane with a plastic ball and covers it perfectly. You want to go right in between the three pin and the ten pin, and he's using that plastic ball to create the deflection just in case he's a little bit too full in the face of the three pin. Talking about his terrible start, he said, you know, two or three years ago he might have given up, but he said it was really gut check time and really no panic set in. But you know, he's a fourth year player, and he is getting to be more seasoned now than he was back whenever he was having those problems like that. And so if players stay out here long enough, they are going to mature and they are going to throw better shots. Now, maybe that shot right there wasn't the best in the world for Chris Barnes, but I foresee him making some type of adjustment, even maybe moving a little bit deeper and throwing it a little bit slower. Now, what he's going to have to do on this spare is, is the same way he shot the baby split just a minute ago, he has to shoot it the same exact way. The ball will go just to the right of the three pin, push three pin over into the seven and convert the spare. Let's see how successful he is. See, notice this time he picked up his strike ball and tried to hook it into it a little bit. What he uses is, is maybe a, uh, a process of elimination there that will give, be more forgiving. If he gets it a little bit too far to the right, the ball will roll up and still maybe catch the three. If he gets it left, the ball will stay on the oil and catch the three. So that was just a way he just decided to shoot that spare. Ball 
makes a real slow roll on the back end. Mike actually probably needs to even slow the speed down even more because the ball is cornering late. It means it's missing his window of opportunity to break towards the pocket, and it's coming in light pocket flush, which is going to leave a seven pin a lot of times. Sunglasses, sunblock, and no problem outside at the Sun Bowl. Mike Albee. And, and a crack of a smile there. Up by 16. Well, Mike feels very fortunate right now. I would have suspected Chris would have put a little bit more heat on him than what's done. So Mike's got everything going for him right now, and sometimes those things happen. He wants this to be soft. Oh, to corner. Close. Get it to corner. And as you heard him right there, he said that ought to be close. He looks like from here he got it inside target a little bit. He didn't really get the good heavy roll on it, so he thought that that might hold pocket. Well, it didn't. The lanes might be breaking down and cause the ball to roll up into the nose and leave the 4-7-10 split. He's going to have to get the ball just to the left of the 4-pin to slide it over and to convert the 10-pin. Aldi and Barnes, match number three. Here at the Villages, a millionaire country club lifestyle at a price that's friendly to a fixed retirement budget. We'll come right back. Back at the Villages, where they invite you to experience the warmth of living in Florida's friendliest retirement hometown. UPBA bowlers have never seen hospitality like you've had this week. It's been marvelous. They set up the facilities here excellent for us this week. We never wanted for a thing. I'll tell you what, can we bowl here every week? I was thinking about it. Chris Barnes, who started bowling when he was seven years young, so it's appropriate to wish him a happy 31st birthday this Sunday afternoon. He's going to be as old as me someday. Now, while we were away, Chris got up on the right lane, left a four pin, and struck on the left lane, and then gets up and strikes again on the right lane. Mike encountered disaster. He struck on the right lane and then split again on the left lane, the same exact split, the 4 7 10. So that puts Chris 30 pins ahead right now and working. Now, an interesting sidebar to this, and I talked to John Forrest, the lane guy today, and what we have is, you notice the first couple of matches, we it was overcast, all right? John told me that the temperature of the lane surface is 98 degrees when it's overcast, but when the sun comes out like it is right now, the temperature surface goes up to 112 degrees. Mike has split two times on this left lane, and it's got to be a byproduct of the lane heating up. All right. Chris Barnes is still up 30 pins. Mike, if he's going to do anything to turn this around, he's got to do it right here. He needs to focus on a strike. He made the adjustment. Great shot by Mike Albee. It looked like from here he moved a couple of boards to the right, moved his target in a little bit to hold the oil a little bit longer. The ball cornered perfectly. Solid, solid shot from Mike Albee. You, know, you were talking about the lane conditions and the heat. Chris was saying last night that a combination between the heat and, ironically, the dust will make the ball hook more. Exactly. What it'll do is it'll pull the oil together, and the ball will take it takes a footprint on the lane. And so this will all stick to the bowling ball and transfer it from the front of the lane to the back of the lane. That's a carry-down factor, but it'll erode it at a lot more rapid pace. And so the oil will actually, where the key break points you're looking at, will start to hook more and more and more and more as the day goes on. So it's a big factor in today's competition. Simple spare for Chris, throws the plastic ball straight at it, and that is recommended for all bowlers across America to do. Throw more direct at your single pin spares. You will raise the percentage of times you will make that pin largely. The bowling world lost one of its greatest ambassadors on Monday when Joe Norris died of complications from pneumonia at the age of 93. He competed in a record-tying 71 ABC Championship tournaments and holds the record for career pinfall with over 123,000. A member of seven Hall of Fames, including the ABC, 
He, of course, will be remembered for his endless enthusiasm for the sport of bowling. And the PBA extends its sympathy to the Norris family. Hall of Famer extraordinaire, and I think maybe this Florida sunshine a testament to you know Joe is smiling and enjoying this sellout crowd. Truly, truly, truly a great bowler at this time. He's going to be surely missed. Chris Barnes is nine pins up in this match. Mike has no room for error. This has to be a great shot right here, or we could be, he could be in serious trouble. Yeah! And he pulls it out. Mike shows some emotion. He wants it. He wants it bad. The best Mike Albee can bowl right here in this 10th frame is 214. Chris Barnes would be forced to strike out for 223. So that's the emotion that just runs hard with Mike Albee. He is a true competitor, and he will not settle for second best. Albee bowled last week, made the finals in Burlington, headed here, finished up on Sunday, caught an early flight, bowled in the shootout here, says he's been on the go, on the run ever since. Is a human being. Great shot. Great shot. He is lined up now on that lane. He has moved his feet. He's made the adjustment. He moved his feet to the right. He's moved his target half the distance. And so that'll put the ball in the oil a little bit better, let it travel down the lane a little bit longer, and get it to the proper spot of the pocket. Adjusting is key, key, key to these lanes ever so changing. Chris's wife, Linda, not here this week. She is watching on TV with her hands full. She's actually bowling in an LPBA event this week herself. Now, right. Mike. She is a fantastic bowler, and she has won some major events. Now, if Mike gets his strike right here, he will force Chris Barnes to strike out. And he's got it. Great shot by the great champion, Mike Albee. Staring straight ahead is Chris Barnes. He never looked. He's just looking at his lane like he knows what he's got to do. What do I have to do to win? He's been in the finals so many times. Well, you know what? He controls his destiny right now in the 10th frame. I'm going to tell you what. When he signed on, he didn't sign on to finish second. So this is part of the job. You've got to get up, keep your emotions in check, and just go throw three of the greatest shots he's ever pitched in his career. Yeah. Close. All of them. Chris Barnes was second in Latham, New York, at the Parker Bone Tournament up there. To the eventual champion, Parker, who is here today with his fiance, Leslie. After finishing eighth here this week, Parker becomes the fourth player in the history of the PBA to go over the $2 million mark in career earnings. And he is seated directly behind Mike Albee in the fourth row, kind of watching and lending his support, as so many of the bowlers do. Barnes now. Chris needs two strikes in the 10th and one pin to win this match. Gut check coming up right here. And yes, sir! Still alive. Still alive, and that is what we call the messenger. The one pin goes to the sideboard with the power that Chris throws and ricochets off the sideboard and heads right straight for the 10 pin. Just absolute tomahawk in it. Chris throws a lot of balls, so this is a common occurrence for him. I'm just so jealous. Sixth in the PBA World Power Rankings. You saw the good action there, and oh, Heavenly Father. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is this is a gut check shot here, and you know what? Chris has done something in this game that I really didn't think he would do. All week, he played the ball more from left to right, even in tricky situations. In the last five or six shots, he's gone the other direction. He is going more right to left now, playing the ball down the boards more. Let's see if he can handle the pressure. <laughs> Yeah. Absolute great shot by Chris Barnes. That is the future of the PBA right there. Great, great, great competitor. He gave you that Pete Weber reaction there. Barnes is a true competitor, and he will not settle for anything less than a win. And I'll tell you what, I watch him in match play week in, week out, and he's just that same way on the lanes as he is here today. All he needs is one pin right here. Keep it behind the foul line as he's done. You have a winner in Chris Barnes. That's all you had to do. Good couple of weeks, though, for Mike Albee. So the finals of the Villages Sun Bowl 2001, the top seed, Jason Couch against Chris Barnes when we come right back. Welcome back to the Villages. We've had some terrific matches. First off, Pete Weber started with five strikes in a row. He dispensed with Doug Kent. 
In number two, though, Mike Albee was way too much for Mr. Weber to handle, looking for his 26th PBA title. And a terrific match we just saw the conclusion of, doing what he had to do with the double and then marking. Chris Barnes advances to meet the, meet the number one seed, Jason Couch. Chris Barnes has got an idea right now. He wants to play the ball down the lane, and he, he can't make any changes now. This has to be it. He's going to be on his way. Well, shows you right there, under the pressure, he's going to throw a great shot like that. So he sees the lane the way that he wants to see it. And now he's just going to throw to fo try to focus on throwing 12 of the best shots he can throw. Rematch of the 99 Tournament of Champions where Jason bested Barnes on TV. Couch pretty much with a 198 average. And all that power. Jason said he has got to be very, very, very careful on how hard he throws the ball. He said they're a little tighter on his side this week, especially today, and he has really controlled his speed perfectly. Jason up on the left lane. He wants this strike to get out on Chris Barnes early. And he's got it. There you have it. He is a phenomenal champion. I'll tell you what, that strike ball he throws is devastating. He slaps those seven pins out week in, week out. Chris Barnes' success factor this day. Chris Barnes has had a lot of strikes. He Early in the matches, he was trying to play the lanes a little bit too much open, and he didn't get as many strikes as he'd like early on. The splits kind of held him down. Here of lately, he has started squaring the lane down, meaning he's pulled his target to the left, his feet to the right, and now his strike percentage is going up, and his scores are going up. High score of the week. 268, low score, 147, and keep in mind that terrible start. I mean, here he is in the finals, and he was halfway down the highway, wasn't he? Well, he wasn't too happy after the first two games, but he had a little help, chose the right ball, and he's not a quitter. He is not a quitter at all. He says, you know, I'm going to make the best of this I can, and he's got a chance to win the tournament. He was a little quick off that shot right there. He got to the foul line, and if you noticed, he bailed off the shot. He stood up on it right at the release point, so he didn't complete the rotation to get his hand to the side of the ball to make the ball climb the corner. Chris is also an excellent spare shooter. Course of the week, you don't see him miss very, very, very many spares at all. Jason, in the finals last week, he was the number one seed, finished second in Latham. He was the number two seed and finished up third. Ask him the difference about being the number one seed. And he said, hey, you know what? I don't mind sitting at all. It's a definite advantage to be the top seed. Number one thing is, is that he gets to pick the lane that he wants to start on. And being able to do that right there gives him an advantage in making Chris finish first. So he's uh, finished last, rather. It puts the pressure on him so that... Jason, if he bowls a big game or an adequate game, he can be setting down and let Chris control his destiny. Talked about Parker Bone going over the $2 million mark, only the fourth person in PBA history to accomplish that. And Brian Goble, titleist, including the 1998 Tournament of Champions. Mark Great Roth player. warming up for the senior tour. He'll be eligible when he turns 50 in April, a couple of weeks away. The Chief, Brian Himmler, made his second match play appearance of the year, finishing 20th. There is what has happened so far. We mentioned Mark Roth getting ready to turn 50 in the month of April. He is going to tear that seniors tour totally up. Meanwhile, the Chief made his second match play appearance of the year, finished up 20th. Eugene McCune, Don McCune's son, is a very, very talented player, and he has a future ahead of him. He's very, very talented. He can do a lot of things with a bowling ball. Jason. Talked last night about being very aggressive right out of the gate. Cannot be scared, cannot be intimidated, not his style at all, whether it's on the bowling lane or on the golf course. Talk to Jason about this. I have what is called, labeled him as having a demon in his pocket. He, as in a lot of match play appearances, will get up there and start getting over pumped and start throwing the ball hard as he did right there, and he lets these shots get away from him. His opponents manage to come up, sneak up on him, and catch him and pass him. Jason has to control these emotions and duplicate every shot to precision. 
You know, the villages here encompasses 15 square miles. They're in three different counties, including South Lake County. That's where Jason Couch hails from. So a lot of folks from Claremont right here pulling for the number one seat. He's a local favorite, and I'm going to tell you what, that has a lot to do with his motivation today. These people are geared for him, they're ready for him, and they're keeping him up, and that's what he needs right now to win this tournament. Meanwhile, Chris Barnes trying to remove that albatross from around his neck. The longest current streak on tour for telecast, making the telecast with no victories. 15, the all-time record. Well, he's got a ways to go, though. <laughs> 27. Chris gets in the same situation in a lot of telecast, especially match play in the the championship round where he'll get hit the pocket and get a lot of times. He'll leave 10 pins, he'll leave 4 pins, he'll leave 8 pins, and he gets down on himself. That is the one thing that he cannot do is get down on himself. He has to focus, see 10 pins go off the deck, and then get up and execute to it. That is the only way he's going to beat Jason Kauscher. Barnes up by 9. One thing you have to do in this position Chris is in right now is forget about the last frame. He's looking forward to the next shot right here, and he needs to knock it down. Mentioned that the Villages measures 15 square miles right now, so you take a look at the dimensions of a bowling lane. How many lanes would fit into the Villages? 15 by 15 miles? 1.3 million bowling lanes. They'll build a few more here by the time they build out the other 15. They've got 30 square miles of property. They're building about 2,000 homes a year, and they have to build one golf hole for every 81 homes that they sell. Well, I darn sure wouldn't want to strip those by hand. <laughs> Speaking of golf, this man right here was only going to play nine the other day in our little uh, golf outing, and he was having so much fun and playing so well, he finished up and played the back nine just 45 minutes before having to come back here to the Village's Sun Bowl 2001 and uh, continue his, span his uh, qualifying. Well, there's no big shocker there. He felt so confident in the qualifying this week. He led by a pretty large amount, so I didn't think he had too much to worry about. This is what he was really focused on right here is this one game for all the chili beans. Barnes up by just a narrow two pins. No time for Chris to take a nap right now. He's going to have to keep his eyes on what he's doing. And Cliff Couch is there. Mom Darlene. Darlene is uh, hiding off in the shade under the veranda. A little bit of everything today under the Florida sun. We've had sunshine. We've had rain. We've had spritzing and sprinkles. We've had wind. And more importantly, we've had great PBA Hall of Fame bowling. The number one seed, Jason Kout, up against the second seed. On his birthday, 31 years of age, Chris Barnes. How appropriate would that be? Lots more straight ahead. Chris Barnes got up on the right lane and failed to convert the double. He threw a bad shot, left the 4-7 and spared, and then struck on the left lane. Jason gets up after a strike, and then he splits, leaves the 6-7-10. Chris, Chris Barnes is up 14 pins. So now on lane number one, needs some help and gets it. Excellent shot by Jason Couch. Said if there's been a plus this week for Jason, it's been his mechanics and his timing. If he's had a problem, it's been his approach. Jason has a tendency to get a little bit too fast with his feet, and you see with a real high backswing, he drops the ball into the swing so tightly underneath the shoulder, close to the ankle, and this is something every bowler in America needs to pay attention to because it is the way you throw a perfect bowling shot. Chris Barnes, the same way, close to the ankle. Yes. He has been leading the PBA Tour the last year or so in just about, as you know, David, every statistical category, but still the goose egg. What does he have to do to get over the hump? Personally, I think this is all mental. Uh, he just has had a bunch of weird... Well, you've got to look back to it last year. Last year, he was bowling a lot of the three-man matches. It is very difficult to get out of those three-man matches just to get to the title match alone. So, in this type of format right here, Chris Barnes could shine a lot better in the future, more so than he has in the past. Now, right now, Chris is up 14 pins, and he could have this whole thing in his hands today to break this onus. 15. <laughs> Chris, 
bells in the square just went off. Chris made a note that was 215. This is a must, must strike for Chris if he wants to win this title. Everything's going into this shot. It's off his hand good. Oh, no. You heard him say, oh, no. He thought he threw that ball as good as he can. From my perspective up here, he got off the shot just a little bit quick. He didn't complete the shot, which allows the ball to round the corner a little stronger to get deeper into the pocket. If you'll, if you'll look right here on this shot right here, when he comes out, the ball just barely catches the one pin, sends everything over to the left side, leaving the 2 8 10. This is a very difficult spare to convert, although it is possible. The pins would have to have come out of the back of the pit, catch the 10 pin from behind in order to make it. Well, if you're enjoying action here from the Village's Sun Bowl 2001, one event left in the winter, that's the battle at Little Creek. And for more, log on, find out about the PBA's best, including Jason Kapp, Chris Barnes, Parker Bone, all the latest PBA news on the PBA's website at pba.com. This is the tournament shot for Jason Couch. He can really put the, the lockdown on Chris Barnes right here if he can put this, this shot away with 10 and a pit. Harry for me. And a big reaction from the intensified Jason Couch. That's Kelly Couch, daughters Courtney and Haley. A lot of support. We mentioned that uh, he is the pride of Claremont, not far from the villages here. Sometimes hometown support can be a negative. A little extra pressure? It's extra pressure, and you feel like you don't want to let them down, that's for sure. And so I don't believe Jason thinks that way because he is a feisty, feisty competitor, and he just loves to win. I think he wants to put more of his show on than anything. This is the tournament shot for Jason Couch right here. He set himself up in the ninth frame for this shot right here for all the marbles. He converts this right here, and notice he's taking a deep breath. If he converts this, it is all over. See how he likes it. Yeah! Excellent shot. There's your winner, Jason Couch. It'll be national title number nine for the top seed. All he needs now is just count. Stay behind the foul line. Don't throw it in the gutter. Just knock some pins down, and we have a champion, hometown champion. He needs five pins to be exact. There he is. There's a champion, Jason Couch, a great player in his own right. And you can just see the disappointment and some of the oxygen go out of Barnsey. Chris in the finals again. Chris, Keep that money in Florida. 16 telecast now. He is made with no wins, but a big day for Claremont's own, and they're on their feet here at the Villages. The handshake from Chris, who is a class act. So proud of you. <laughs> he just goes, Woo. Chris Barnes will be back. He is a fun this phenomenal bowler does all the things right with this game. National title number nine. We'll talk to Jason, our champion here, as the PBA has rolled to the villages in Central Florida, an award-winning slice of paradise where retirement means a world of play. 223 to 201, his ninth PBA title. The man behind the uh, scenes right there is Jason Couch, the pride of Claremont. You know, they say here at the Villages that they're not selling homes, they're selling happiness and lifestyle. Well, there's some happiness here, 25,000 good reasons. Jennifer Parr, who's the Vice President of Sales, with a presentation. Jennifer? Jason, with Home Court Advantage, it's been a beautiful day in the Villages for you. Congratulations, and here's 25,000. Thank you very much, Jennifer. I certainly appreciate it. And the Director of Bowling here at the Villages, putting on a terrific week for the PBA with great hospitality, our friend Dave Bushman with the lovely Crystal. Dave? Jason, congratulations. You both great all week, now topped off by a super game. Congratulations. Thank you, Dave. I certainly appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much. 
I'd like to thank a couple of people today. First of all, I'd like to thank David Ozio. Gave me a little lecture before the uh, match today. He said, whoever's the most patient will be the guy on top. And I stayed patient that last match. Del Ballard from Ebonite, thank you. Ebonite, thank you very much. And thank you, ESPN, especially the villages and the people here. Woo! Well, the preceding a paid political announcement. You told us last night you were going to have to be aggressive right from the start, and you were. Well, you know, I, I wasn't sure who I was going to bowl. There's all Hall of Famers on there, and eventual Hall of Famers, especially Chris Barnes. Uh, I bowled him in the Tournament of Champions a few years back, and uh, I think this is the two we're going to battle out most. It's going to be me and Chris in the future, and uh, you have to get out on him early or he'll crush you. Let's talk about your intensity. Does that sometimes fuel your performance out there? I think it does, and uh, sometimes it hurts it. I think that's what uh, David Ozio was talking about today. Be patient and let the shots work itself. Are you on the payroll here? You're going to have to give tips to all five finalists. Jason's a great bowler, and he gets in this situation a lot, and sometimes he lets it get away from him, and today he controlled it perfectly, so I'm proud of you, my boy. <laughs> Thank you, Grandpa. <laughs> how, how would you define momentum? Oh, boy, the last three weeks, third, second, first. Uh, I bowl Robert Smith next week at the uh, Battle at Little Creek. Look out, Robert, I'm coming for you. How would you define pressure? This was pressure this week, bowling in front of your hometown crowd and uh, pulling out the victory is just incredible. Uh, words are hard to describe right now, it really is. When we look ahead to next week in the Battle at Little Creek, can momentum carry on the way it has the last couple weeks for Jason Couch? I think so. It's it's all match play next week. It's a best of five in the first match, and uh, I'm certainly riding a big wave of confidence right now. Let's see if I can't ride it into Virginia Beach. And the nice thing is that my golf game did not distract from your bowling at all, right? Uh, you were out there in the golf course and still made it here. Well, on that par three when you knocked that eight iron stiff, it scared <laughs> me a little bit. I might need some strokes. We'll see you next week in Virginia, right? Thanks, Jim. Thanks, too, to all of our good friends here at the Villages. We talk about this great retirement community, a great country club environment with great golf and great bowling. You'll see our champion, Jason Couch, next week as the battle at Little Creek will be on at 2 o'clock Eastern time here on the Worldwide Leader in Sports, the final winter tour stop. Coming up next, women's college basketball action, the Lady Wolverines against the Lady Lions of Penn State right here on ESPN. So for Dave Ozio, our champion, Jason Couch, all our friends here at the Villages, thanks for joining us on ESPN. All our PBA bowling team has rolled here to this world-class class facility. We'll say so long for now, and see you next week at the Battle at Little Creek from Virginia Beach. This has been a presentation of ESPN, the worldwide leader in sports. For more information, log on to ESPN.com.